So we can start with the, the discussion and question uh, session. So please, uh, who would be not shy and ask the first question? Here? Yeah. Um, so I have a question to Martin. Um, you are presenting the data that mainly um, gram-positive bacteria had an influence on the gut health. And my question is, what about gram-negative, like E. coli? And this is the first question. And the second one is um, about si uh, enrofloxacin. You said it will be restricted uh, within next year, the use of um, enrofloxacin. What will be the alternative? OK, so uh, um, for the enrofloxacin, let me start with that question. Um, well, the alternative will be whatever antibiotic is left on your antibiogram that is um, showing sensitivity uh, to that bacterium that you have isolated. So that means that we don't have restrict. In fact, in, in the European legislation, you don't have any restriction of antibiotics. Eh? It's not like there's a legal use of antibiotics as long as a veterinarian can explain why he's using that uh, medication. The point is that in the past, you didn't have to prove. Eh? You didn't have to prove anything. Now, where we will go to, and in fact, it's not the wrong thing to do. If you want to use enrofloxacin, I make an antibiogram with all available antibiotics we have, and I can show that the only drug that is still active is enrofloxacin. I should use, I'm even forced ethically and legally, I'm forced to use enrofloxacin, which is, which is a different thing than what we do today, is we have an indication of cholibacillosis, uh, first week mortality. Um, we know the, the birds come from a bad uh, breeder flock, and uh, a lot of farms, in this case, would just start using three to five days enrofloxacin at start of, uh, of the farm without taking any antibiogram. That is what, what will be uh, not allowed anymore, okay? Uh, and the first question was, uh, can, can you just repeat? Ah, yeah, okay. Um, well, that's an in interesting uh, question. I don't know. Um, it, you know that in, in, in mammals, E. coli is, of course, a very important um, uh, potential intestinal pathogen. Uh, but we, I had the same discussion uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, we don't see E. coli, or we don't consider it as a, a common pathogen. Um, the reasons for that um, yeah, are not really clear to me. I think there's a, you could think of a couple of theories. Uh, uh, but apparently, what we see is that we have a gram-positive problem when we talk about overgrowth of bacteria, not a gram-negative. There are exceptional cases described of uh, cholibacillosis problems, intestinal problems, uh, cholegranulomas. Eh? So it's not that this is not existing or not known, uh, but in general, uh, generally, we don't see an overgrowth of uh, gram-negatives. Uh, we always see that with gram-positives. I don't know if someone else can add something to that. Why, why is that? I don't know. Yeah, it's opportunistic, but uh, also Clostridium you could call opportunistic. Yeah. They are both of them are normal inhabitants of the of the of the of the gut. Yeah. Both E. coli, the name says it in itself, uh, is a normal inhabitant. Clostridium also, but why is Clostridium today causing these problems and E. coli uh, not in poultry? I, it's, uh, I don't know. Q Q Martin. Yes, here. Thank you for the doctor from CB. Uh, I observe uh, the stocking density, 33 kilogram per meter square. This is uh, very uh, low comparing with the standard breed. Why you decide to go to this level, firstly? Secondly, all in, all out, it is meaning, uh, does it mean for one house or for one farm? Because I see around 30 house maybe in one unit. Uh, and for Dr. Smith? Uh, if, if you are okay, we will answer the first one and then you ask the second one. Okay, okay? thank yeah. you. This is a good question. After you ask the first question, I forgot it to start with the second one. <laughs> the first question is why we uh, less the chicken 33 kilogram per square meter, right? Yes. Is this uh, effective or, or, or what? Why you decide to go to this level? Okay. Is 36, 38, yeah, because uh, most of the company in Thailand we export to to EU. We have to follow the rule and regulation from the EU and also all retailer 
like you you can retail or they, they stick to to uh, implement on on the animal welfare practices even we are third third country uh, we should do strict like a member state has done that's why we try to to this one and also our competent authority give the recreation at 33 kilogram per square meter this is our thailand recreation this is the first one the second one about all in all out yes we do all in farms then cash on the farm out keep it empty on the farms all even farms two empty. house three house four house we cash it on make it farm empty then we replace on the farms again not one house per one house on farm in farm out farms so 14 days from the last uh, ch chicken in the unit yeah to the like, first chicks yeah like a bigger biggest farms one million they catch within f three to five days on <laughs> then make it empty replace the new batch within three days or five days for the farm again this is our system Thank you. Then the second question. Uh, for Mr. Smith, uh, about uh, the, la, um, the la low, medium, high, and extra, it is affected by the age of uh, slaughter bird or the target body weight. For example, in the uh, Middle East or in Jordan, we slaughter the bird at 1.6 kilogram. So did you think there is a difference will be between medium, low, uh, extra? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, those birds were like all males to 42 days. So they were, I don't know what that was, three kilos. Would it be six? six so it's a bigger bird than what you're growing there. there. In Jordan, you say? Okay. Um, so he, he has a feeding schedule there. Uh, I think if, and you, if you saw that, uh, I may not put everything down, but it was something like, I think he fed like a half pound of starter feed, uh, you know, the feeding schedule's there. So you could feed that feeding schedule to try to get those same type of results. So in your case, where you're going one and a half kilo or something, so that's like three and a half to four pounds. So you would only probably feed three feeds. You wouldn't need the fourth feed. Well, he didn't feed four feeds in that study. He only fed three feeds. So you would just finish earlier. You know, normally what we do, we're feeding about 14 days of starter, about a pound per bird, and then three pounds of the second feed, what we you call grower or something like that. And then if we're going to that size bird, we would finish them on what we call our withdrawal one, which would be, you know, at probably 35 to 40 days or something like that, you know. So that would be the feed. And you could feed those same feeds. You know, you're going to get a little different results because those are smaller birds. So you might, could, you might could feed a little cheaper feed, but you don't have much, you know, you just have to evaluate your feeding program. What's the best, what, how to optimize that to make the most cost. Um, if you're not deboning, you're selling whole small birds, then maybe the medium high would be better than the high high, for example. Be, it more be more cost effective. Thank you. Some more questions? Yeah, here. Voilà, c'est au sujet des antibiotiques, en fait. Donc, il y a une certaine ambiguïté. Ce que j'ai compris au début, donc les bêta-lactamines, euh, macrolides et euh, quinalones seront interdites en, en Europe. Est-ce que ça sera interdit ou bien ça sera plus, euh, comment dirais-je, plus contrôlé par la législation Parce qu'en fait, aux États-Unis, d'après ce que j'ai compris, les enrofloxacines sont totalement, les quinolones sont totalement interdites. Donc, voilà, c'est ma question. So Martin speaks French, but I will translate for the room. Uh, so the question is about uh, the, the, the forbidding of some family of antibiotics, or it will be more control. So this is not the same point of view. Well, that is depending on the country. Um, so in some countries, they will really go to legal, um, yeah, legal restriction of the antibiotic. In some other countries, it will not go that far. Uh, but in general, it's, the, the result is the same. Uh, the sooner we take action as an industry, the better we are placed to, let's say, to still keep the possibility for um, really uh, uh, cases where we have only, for instance, enrofloxacin, like the example that was given earlier, that we can still use it. If we let the society do, 
they will just legally forbid the complete use of these antibiotics. So uh, the question is, uh, I cannot answer 100% uh, because it really it will depend on the country. Uh, I just hope that we take proactively enough um, decisions that will uh, lead that um, uh, the legal restrictions are as low as possible and that we can self or auto-regulate our own antibiotic use. That is always uh, more interesting. Okay, thank you. Question, I would like, yeah, Andrew? I would just like to ask uh, Dr. Pontino regarding um, sustainability. In all of the work she showed, she never showed anything on f feed efficiency. Do you take this into consideration as land usage for feed production? Well, um, for example, in the economic uh, in, the, in the economic pillar, we tested the, um, the the production costs. So yes, the feed the the, um, the cost of the feed is included in the in the so in the economic pillar, and even in the social pillar, we tested the impacts of the of the feed and of the raw materials on uh, different um, uh, their impacts on the environment. For example, eutrophication. Um, um, yeah, use of water and etc. And with uh, each uh, impact of each raw material, for example, soya, wet, uh, corn, etc. Did I answer your question a bit? <laughs> Could you rephrase uh, maybe if, you, if I didn't answer your question? He's an English speaker native, but they cannot phrase him. <laughs> but I'm not speaking to an English native speaker. <laughs> No, the thing is that when you have a production unit that has a higher FCR, you have to have greater land mass to produce the same amount of feed, to produce the same amount of meat. Is that actually calculated within the sustainability equation? Yeah, but um, the assessment was on, um, on a typical case. So we took the, the typical case and we assessed the width and uh, um, a feed conversion and etc., uh, uh, which is real. And when we tested the, um, the one innovation, here was uh, the innovation was on the dependency of uh, uh, protein, protein crops. But we also made um, innovation, uh, we tested innovation innovation about different kind of, uh, of poultry and with a different uh, con, con, uh, feed ratio and etc. Uh, so yes, it's included in the, in the assessment with uh, the economic pillar. But here you couldn't see that because it was uh, included in the typical case. So it, we focused on one case. Thank you. We have the opportunity to have one or two more. Nigel? One more question. Okay. Computer models will do a lot of the uh, answering the questions that you guys raised from a uh, live production standpoint, meat through the plant, meat in the package. Are any of you using a computer modeling program like the Gauss or the camera model? Yeah. He, uh, David's asked us, uh, you know, asked us, well, do you use a model? Because there's the EFG model, uh, Fisher, Gauss, uh, Emmons. Uh, there's other models too. Uh, it went blank on them, but uh, we have we have the EFG model uh, installed. At Roy's got it. We've used it, tried to give us clues to how to feed. Uh, but it's, uh, to tell you the truth, no, we haven't actually. And before that, we've looked at models. You know, back in the days of Novus. Uh, uh, Avigen has some models too, I think, kind of models to try to try to optimize how to f how to feed the birds. You know, uh, let's put the costs in, put out the outputs, inputs, and then you kind of gives you a direction: should I feed a higher nutrient level or a lower nutrient with, with today's prices? And it gives you a direction to go. Um, I, they're great tools. I I, I think that you got to look at it holistically. I don't think you want to, you know, you got to look at the pounds of what you can sell. 
I think sometimes the models get in, hooked onto, well, breast meats, you need this much breast meat, and it's at this price. That drives the economic model most of the time. And a lot of these models were driven off of lysine or methionine, because the people that were trying to push them or use them, you know, the higher lysine, higher methionine, tended to show uh, better economic returns. But that's not all of it. I know they're a very good tool. I believe they can be used. We aren't using it. Well, that's the truth. Yes, uh, it is, it's not my field for, for nutrition, but uh, for the software that you used, I think like uh, in USA, it used uh, Peter, uh, Philip already explained some. Uh, is this, I'm sorry, I cannot explain in the nutri nutrition field. Sorry, I'm feel wet on <laughs> farm wet. Okay, one last, one last. For a brief one. Ah, yes, Nigel, yes. A question from our Thai colleague. As I understand it, CP has a large number of retail outlets. Do they hinder you or help you in attaining sustainability? So for retail outlet, I think if we are talking about the sustainability, we are talking about a, like a saving energy or how to uh, make a product more sustainable way. Because in terms of sustainability, not only the, the farms, we implement every single uh, value chain. As you see, not only the farming, logistic, everything we have to do in terms of product sustainability, uh, like a hub of food bin, we have to concern all of the total chain of the production. This is your question. Thank you. Well, I think we will uh, conclude here today, and I have a question for you. And then you have to answer to me, who will win? I did not hear anything, who will win? Thank you very much. The bus are waiting for us to go for the evening and uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>